KT's crops empowers kids across the country to grow fresh produce locally to fight against hunger. I talk with Katie Stagolano, the founder of Katie's Crops for this edition of Quentin's Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close Ups on Facebook. Katie Stagolano, welcome to the award winning Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Obviously, you are the founder and the chief executive, uh, I believe, gardener for Katie's Crops, if I'm not mistaken. But obviously, Katie's Crops empowers kids across the country to grow fresh produce locally to fight hunger in communities. What is the state of hunger these days? Especially now with the pandemic and everything that has been going on in the world, there has been a huge increase of people that are struggling with hunger and food insecurity. And so we at Katie's Crops just feel it's so important that we do everything we can to support these people and make sure that they're getting healthy, fresh produce because that is so important for young kids growing up for people to maintain a healthy immune system, fighting diseases like COVID-19, and just to maintain a healthy lifestyle. So there are definitely so many people right now struggling with hunger and food insecurity, people that have lost their jobs, people that have just fallen down on hard times, and we want to do everything we can to support them. Absolutely. Well, then let me ask you the obvious question, Katie. Where are you emotionally? I think that since COVID started, I've seen a huge increase in just the need. And that for me has been heartbreaking. I've become so close with so many of the individuals and families that I help. And they're just the most amazing people, the most giving and kind people who have really just fallen down on hard times. And so it's heartbreaking to see so many people that are struggling. I know when we first started our meal distributions at the beginning of COVID, switching over to a model so that it was safe for everybody, we would have cars lining up and they would literally cause traffic jams because there were so many people lining up waiting for a meal. And I was so happy that I was able to do something to help them. And we have this amazing team that was able to help. But also it was so heartbreaking that there were so many people that are struggling. I think that I've definitely seen a turn and people are really starting to get back up on their feet, which makes me so happy. But it is just devastating to see so many amazing individuals and families that are struggling. What is the biggest difference between when you started the meal distribution program to right now? So when we started our meal distributions, they were originally sit-down dinners. So we started the Katie's Crops dinners over 10 years ago. And they would be sit-down dinners where we would take all the produce from our gardens. We would prepare hot, healthy, and free meals to anyone in need in the community. And then we would serve them kind of, everyone would sit down together. They would make friends with the other dinner guests. And it was just a lot of fun. It was a great social experience for everybody and just a wonderful atmosphere. And then when COVID hit, we usually have between 150 and 250 sitting down in the sit down dinners. Right. And that was no longer something that was an option, not something that was safe for our guests or for our volunteers. So we switched to a drive through distribution where we would prepare the same meals. They'd be hot, healthy, free meals based on vegetables from the garden. But we would take the meals and we would put them into go boxes and then we would pass them out through car windows. And that way we were able to actually serve 500 plus meals. And in 2020, we did this every week. So we served over 18,000 meals in 2020. And now in 2021, we do this every other week and we still serve between 500 and 650 meals every meal distribution. So it has been a huge jump for us, a huge adjustment because obviously nobody, nobody knew the pandemic was coming. Nobody had planned for that. And so for us to switch from doing 150 to 250 sit-down meals to doing 500 plus to-go meals, passing them out through car windows, doing all of that in one day was a big adjustment for us, especially having to have a very small team to keep everyone safe. But it has been an awesome opportunity for us to get 
to as many people and help as many people in the community as possible. And I also love it because I get to talk to all the guests. I get to spend time talking to each and every guest that comes through the line. And that's not something that I often got to do at the sit down meals because there was so much going on and I was constantly running around. So that one on one time with everybody that comes through the line, it means so much to me. And so it's probably my favorite part of the meal distributions. And, and I, I want to ask you about those guests in just a moment, but how did you all, what was your strategic plan to move from the, obviously the sit down meals to now the drive through meals? So it was honestly something that just happened. I feel like looking back at 2020, everything was just a blur. It happened all so quickly. We just knew that the need was increasing. There were so many people that were struggling and that we needed to be there. We needed to support these people. They needed healthy, fresh meals more than ever. And we knew that our past model of doing the sit-down dinners was no longer going to work. It wasn't safe. And it just wasn't a viable option. So we kind of just, I don't even remember how we came up with this idea, but we thought this will be the best way to get to the most people. And we put out a call for help basically to the community. We obviously had not planned to help this many people and we had not planned to be serving this many meals. And so we said we need some support. We need some help purchasing these items, getting everything we need for the dinners. Because yes, we had all the awesome vegetables from the gardens, but then obviously whatever we can't grow, we had to purchase. Right. And during the beginning of the pandemic, food prices just rose dramatically because there were shortages of things right. and it made everything so much more expensive. Now, especially instead of buying for 200 people, we're buying for 500 plus people. So the community was amazing they were incredible they really supported us and helped us get so many of the items that we needed and helped us get everything set for these meal distributions so for that I'm so grateful I mean looking back at it I don't think that I could have planned it and it could have gone as well as it did it was really just people coming together saying we recognize there's a huge need and we want to support you and we were able to serve over 18,000 meals. So it, it somehow all came together. I think it was just divine intervention. Absolutely. And obviously you got a lot of the items from the garden, but what were those items that you had to go out and purchase at the grocery stores or at the farmer's market? So we needed to purchase to-go boxes. We needed lots and lots of to-go boxes. Also the proteins for the dinners. We wanted every dinner to be a well-balanced meal and protein was so expensive, especially when you're buying for so many people. So that was with. And then sometimes we would need pastas, things like that. Just It would really depend on the meal that we're making. And we always tried to focus on making a meal that was healthy, well-balanced, not something that was super expensive for us to buy all the things that we needed for it, but also we wanted to make sure that we were serving the best meal possible, something that all the guests were going to love that was delicious and healthy at the same time. So it was just finding the perfect balance. But I mean, it was items such as we needed canned corn, we needed stuffing mix, yes. we needed rice, pasta. I mean, it was just all sorts of things like that that we used on a regular basis at the dinners and that would help us get the greatest yield possible. And obviously, you talked to a lot of guests that's doing it out through the drive through distributions uh, program. What one of those guests actually tugs at your heart still today, Katie? I mean, honestly, I've grown so close with so many people. I would say the guests at the dinner are like a second family to me. I mean, we celebrated so many things together. This year, my birthday actually fell on one of the meal distribution days. And it was probably the best birthday I've ever had. All the guests were so kind. People brought me cards. They baked me cakes and brought me through the line. And one of the guests even called the news and said, it's Katie's birthday. Like, you need to come out. And it was just, it was so heartwarming and just such an amazing way to spend my birthday with all of these people. There are so many people that I have grown so close with. There are kids that have been coming to the dinners for years and years and getting to see them, watch them grow up. I mean, there are, there is this one lady, Miss Sylvia. I love her so much. She's actually the lady who called the news and was like, it is Katie's birthday. You need to come out. It's such an important 
day and it was so sweet of her she always comes through with the biggest smile on her face and is always helping her neighbors in need and just really is one of the sweetest people ever and for her to think about oh my gosh it's your birthday what can I do to make it special and things like that it was just it was awesome I think that I'm so blessed to have so many amazing people in my life, especially the guests at the meal distributions, because I think about it and I may not have crossed paths with them if it weren't for Katie's Crops. And I feel so blessed that I did. And, and, you know, speaking of which, I know obviously to meet the community needs, you have launched a vast expansion of the flagship garden that will increase your growing space by one third, I believe. What are the growing needs right now in the community? So the growing needs of the community definitely have a lot to do with COVID and people that are out of work due to COVID and people that are really just struggling. Also, people with increased medical bills, they're wondering between paying their medical bills and putting food on the table, paying their rent and putting food on the table. I mean, there's so many factors that go into people that are struggling with hunger and food insecurity. And we also know that we are probably not going to go back to sit down dinners for a very long time. If we ever do go back, this system that we've created with our meal distributions, it works amazing. We're able to help so many people. I mean, before we even have all the guests come through the line, we have over 120 meals go out the door for individuals that are homebound, that don't have transportation, that have autoimmune diseases and can't come out to the meal distributions, things like that. And so we're just able to help so many more people this way. And so we know that we need to increase the amount of produce we're growing to help sustain these meal distributions, knowing that every other week we're making 500 plus meals and that will help offset our costs, which will allow us to continue to keep doing more meal distributions and also just being able to donate to the local homeless shelters, the local food pantries and directly to families in need because all of those people are struggling as well. And what are those partners that you have now? And how many partners do you want next to actually grow? So we, in terms of places that we donate the produce, we donate to the local food pantries and the men's and women's shelters in the area. And we've been donating to them for years. And we want to make sure that we can do everything we can to support them. We have gardens in South Carolina. I want to say we have over 15 gardens we have a lot of gardens in the low country. All of our gardens are started and maintained by kids. All the produce is donated directly to families in need. And those in need, they pick where they want to donate their produce to as long as it goes to those struggling with hunger and food insecurity. And so we, in January of this year, awarded the supplies for 75 new Katie's Crops growers to come on. And so we now have over 115 Katie's Crops gardens growing in over 30 states across the United States, which is so exciting. It's so amazing. It's just awesome to see all of these kids that are so passionate about helping their communities out. I mean, it means the world to me that I'm able to help them and support them and see just all the amazing things that they do. We have kids growing thousands of pounds of produce in their backyard and just making these huge impacts in their community. So I am very excited about all the kids we have growing across the country. And I'm excited for next year to continue to expand our growers. I'm hoping that we will eventually get to gardens in all 50 states and then go international. That is a huge goal of ours. Absolutely. It's going to happen. And let me ask you this too, Katie. Which one of those gardens around the country now that resembles your first one when you had, had your first garden in your backyard as a kid? Oh my goodness. So our new growers that we had, the 75, they are all growing in their backyards because when I was getting ready to put out the applications for the Katie's Crops growers, we were in peak COVID time. And I wasn't sure that by the time we had picked the people that would be growing with us, the kids that would be growing and things like that, I wasn't sure what was going to be the state of the world, how COVID was going to be, were we still going to have stay-at-home mandates and lockdowns, were, is it going to be completely done with? I wasn't sure, and I wanted to make sure that these kids could access their gardens, especially now that people need the produce most. So all of these kids received grower boxes with everything that they needed in them to start a garden in their own backyard. So all these kids are growing at home, which is amazing, awesome. They're doing incredible jobs and everything that they're growing and their gardens in their backyards 
so closely resemble where I grew my cabbage in my first garden in my backyard. Yes. So it's awesome to have so many kids growing at home right now. I think that it's incredible to know that they'll always have access to their garden because during some of the lockdowns, we had some growers that were struggling to gain access to their gardens. It wasn't safe to gain access to them, but it was also a time when people needed the produce the most. So we were wanted to make sure that that didn't happen again. And what, what is the demand for fresh produce right now, as you know it? There is a very big demand for fresh produce right now, especially people that are elderly, people that are struggling with autoimmune diseases and other diseases, young children, people that just want to keep their immune systems up, be able to fight diseases like COVID-19, people that want to maintain a healthy lifestyle, and children that are growing up that need to have fresh produce to make sure that they grow up to become big, strong adults. I mean, there's so many reasons why fresh produce is so important. And I think programs that offer fresh produce are amazing. And there's definitely a need for canned goods as well and non perishable items. Those are super important too. So I think there's an equal need for both. But with fresh produce, there's just a lot of benefits to individuals' health. And so we love gardening. We love being able to grow the fresh produce and donate it. So we love being able to do our part. Absolutely. And let me ask you this too. What, in your mind, is the number of people who are obviously living in households who actually are struggling against hunger in Charleston, Berkeley, and Dorchester? So I know that in 2020, I was actually looking at some of the stats the other day. It said that one in four families across the United States were struggling with food insecurity or hunger, which is an alarmingly large amount of people. I know that in 2019, there was over 38 million families in the United States that were struggling as well. And I know that here locally, there are just so many people that have really been affected by the pandemic, especially in terms of people that we've seen come through the lines at the meal distributions. They come from Dorchester County. They come from Charleston County. I mean, they come from Berkeley County, from everywhere. We welcome anybody, no questions asked, but we've definitely seen a really big increase in people coming, new faces that we've never seen before. And we are so happy to be able to help these individuals and families, but we've definitely seen such a large increase of people that are reaching out for help, that are coming through our meal distributions, that are messaging us saying, we are really struggling right now. We don't have transportation. Can you help us and provide meals for us and things like that? So we are happy to do our part, but it's also really heartbreaking just to see now within the last year how the need has just risen exponentially in our local areas. And, you know, I, I want to expand a little bit on the food insecurity, which obviously you're, you know, you want to end that. But what has been the impact uh, of COVID for um, really on all the agriculture and food security, I should say? For us, we have really tried to expand with our new garden expansion. We're hoping to grow an extra several thousand pounds of produce, which will be so helpful. But I know that there have been a crazy number of shortages of I mean, some of the most random things to protein shortages, Mm. to fresh produce shortages, things like that. And so that has definitely been something that has been hard, especially with us doing our 500 plus meals at the meal distributions. Sometimes there are things that you just can't gain access to because there are, there's just been shortages. The demand has increased, things like that. So we are trying very hard to do our part. But I know that there are a lot of people that are struggling because it's so hard for them to gain access to certain things because of these shortages. And I, I want to ask you this, too, because, you know, you, you hear a lot about SNAP and EBT and, you know, all of those things. Should the, the benefit levels be increased with SNAP by chance? So we I'm not extremely familiar with the exact benefit levels on SNAP, but I do know that the price of fresh produce for all of those programs is extremely expensive. And because of that, people will often opt for less healthy options because they're less expensive. They can get more and they, if they have to feed a large family, they can get more food if it's not as healthy and not fresh produce because that can oftentimes be more expensive. 
which is why we want to make sure that we are able to provide as much fresh produce and healthy meals as we can. But we do know a lot of people that have struggled with that because they want to be feeding their families the healthiest food possible, but they can't afford to on these programs because of the cost of them. So that's definitely something that is a factor for a lot of people and causing them to not eat as healthy as they should be or not get the proper nutrients and fresh vegetables they need. And I know obviously you have a lot of kids in the gardens and you work with them a lot. Uh, How do you encourage participation in the federal free and reduced price school meal programs? So we have a large amount of kids that come out in the gardens. We also have a lot of school gardens as well here in the area too. And I think getting kids involved in gardening at an early age makes them more willing to try fresh produce, to try the things that they grow. They plant the seeds, they harvest the produce that comes out, and then they're more willing to try it. And that's awesome because it gets kids introduced to eating healthy at such a young age. I know that a lot of the produce that we grow at schools, it will go back to the families at the schools that are struggling. It will go back to the backpack programs and things like that, which we love and think is amazing. And I think that actually during COVID, one of the reasons why so many people are struggling is because those free and reduced price lunch programs weren't happening because kids were being schooled virtually. They weren't actually physically going to school and they weren't receiving those programs. So that was also a reason that we saw an increase in the number of people that were struggling. So those programs are amazing. They're so helpful to just so many kids and families, and we are happy to do our part. And uh, how do you create a model that will allow the youth to have everything they need to actually grow in those gardens? So with our Kiddies Crops growers, we for this year, we actually had the box that had gardening gloves, seeds, ah. plant tags. It had educational materials, uh, travels. Then they had a gift card to purchase soil. I mean, there was just everything that they would need. So all they would have to do was go out to their backyard and start planting. And that is the first year that we have done the grower boxes. And that was because we wanted to make sure that everybody could get the boxes and then immediately start planting and being able to grow this produce and share it with their community. And so we... We very heavily also focus on educational programming and teaching youth about where their food comes from, everything that they need to know about gardening. We have a master gardener who is amazing and she's always there to answer questions for people and kids and help them in any way that she can. And so that is something that we always try to make sure that we are always available to answer any questions to help in any way that we can. We have a grower website, too, for all of our growers where they can converse with one another, ask each other questions, post pictures, because obviously we have gardens across the United States and we can't access all the gardens. I would love more than anything to be able to go out and visit them and things like that, but that's not always possible. So being able to see pictures of the gardens is helpful. Maybe if they are like, what is this bug eating my plants? They'll send a picture to our master gardener and she'll be like, that is this bug. This is what you need to do to get rid of it. Or just being able to share the triumphs of their gardens as well, which is awesome. So any way that our growers need, we're always here. And we also are growers. Their gardens are sustainable. We continue to fund and support their gardens year after year because we want them to continue to grow and make a difference for as long as they possibly can. And I'm going to get back to that in just a second. But obviously, you've been doing our gardening for a long time. What have you learned now about gardening that you didn't know before? Oh my goodness. I have learned so much about gardening. I think that being able to grow your own food is amazing. I personally am biased. I think that everything I grow out of the garden tastes so much better than anything I can buy at the grocery store. I think it's just the fact that I grew it myself and I'm like, this is amazing. Yes. I have learned, I mean, all the different ways you can garden. I think it's incredible that sometimes people think gardening, oh, I need a huge field, a plot of land, things like that. You can garden in all sorts of fun in different ways. We've had people use recycled tires, kiddie pools. I mean, you could use old rain boots to grow in. Like there's so many different ways that you can garden and you don't necessarily need that big plot of land. You can, I have plants growing on my windowsill right now and they're doing awesome. So, I mean, there's so many different ways that you can garden. And also 
just learning all the new and different ways that you can take your kitchen scraps, turn them into compost, and then have that compost be used to help your plants grow. Just the ways that we can be sustainable, good stewards of the earth. I mean, there's so many cool things that I have learned about gardening. I think that now, over the past 12 years of really growing with Katie's crops, I would con- not an expert yet, but I would consider myself a lot more of a lot of <laughs> Yes, ma'am. And speaking of which, in 2008, I know you brought home a tiny cabbage seedling from school as part of the Bondi's Plants third grade cabbage program. But let me ask you, what did your parents say when you actually brought that cabbage home? So my parents were awesome. They were super excited for me. I was so excited about this cabbage. I remember I got my little brother and I was like, we have to find the perfect spot in our backyard to plant it. And when neighbors came and told us that deer had been spotted in the neighborhood my mom was like you should we should do something about this we don't want the deer to eat your cabbage because she knew how attached I was and she actually helped me reach out to our neighbors who were like surrogate grandparents to me and we constructed a cabbage cage around my cabbage and my parents were totally supportive of that I mean we live on a golf course and the golfers they would be playing by and they'd be like what is that and but my parents were all in super supportive the whole time and the reason why I decided to donate my cabbage to a soup kitchen was actually because my dad had always stressed to us and told us that every night before we sit down to dinner just how lucky we were to be sitting down to a healthy meal and how there are some families who aren't as fortunate as us who rely on soup kitchens for what might be their only meal of the day and so he was really the inspiration for me to donate my cabbage just by reminding us that every night before we sat down to dinner. My mom was awesome. She was the one who helped me find Tri-County Family Ministries, where I did donate my cabbage to. So I think without their support, I would not be where I am today. Katie's Crops would not be in existence. They've just been amazing and, I mean, supported me and been my biggest cheerleaders every step of the way. And from the time you, you obviously brought the cabbage home to the, obviously, the soup kitchen, what was that experience like in the soup kitchen for you? It was an eye-opening experience being able to bring my cabbage to the soup kitchen. When I was nine years old, I wasn't really aware of the issue of hunger and how it was affecting so many people, especially in our community. And there were families just like mine who had fallen down on hard times. And when I pulled up with my cabbage, everyone in line was so kind, so gracious. People were giving me hugs back when you could hug a stranger. And they were saying, thank you. I mean, it was so, it was just such an amazing and welcoming experience. All the volunteers and the staff at Tri-County were incredible. And I was actually able to serve my cabbage to 275 guests at the soup kitchen. And just the whole experience for me changed my life. It really opened my eyes to the issue of hunger. And I thought if one cabbage can feed 275 people, imagine how many people a garden could feed. And that was what inspired me to start Katie's Crops. Wow. And speaking of which, obviously, Katie's Crops have been around for a very, very long time. But how will this be achievable and sustainable? five, ten years from now? So we are always expanding at Katie's Crops. I mean, if in the past 12 years, looking back to where we started, to where we are now is crazy. We are obviously working on having gardens in all 50 states. And with our model, as I mentioned before, it is sustainable because we continue to support the gardens year after year and want the gardens to be growing with us for as long as possible. So we've had gardens that have been passed down for 11 years now. And that has been awesome to have these gardens continually growing. We're working our way up to having gardens in all 50 states. And I think by starting the kids out growing at a young age, they can then pass the gardens down to their siblings, to their friends, people in their community, and keep the gardens growing. And then we're obviously growing the produce to support our meal distributions and kind of just adapting and being amenable to changes along the way. I think that everything happens for a reason. I'm a firm believer in that. And I've kind of been set down this path and there have been challenges and obstacles, but I think not focusing on those and turning them into opportunities has been the key to our success. And I think that'll be why the future will be bright for us. Oh, absolutely. And let me ask you this. You've been obviously in the garden all the time, but what produce have you gotten from the garden recently that you've actually made a healthy meal with? So we, we, when did we plant? We planted 
I want to say a little over a month ago, and we have tomatoes that are starting to come out, peppers. Oh, yes. We're starting to see the beginnings of our eggplant. We have peach trees in the garden, and they're almost ready to harvest. I mean, these peaches are the most amazing peaches I've ever had, and there has to be hundreds of peaches growing in the garden right now. There's blueberries getting ready to be harvested. Our okra is growing really well. So all of this is going to be awesome for our meal distributions. And then in the fall, we right before we took everything out and prepared for spring planting, we were getting, I mean, hundreds of snow peas, which are some of the most amazing things. We were putting those in salad, lettuce, Swiss chard, lots of carrots. So there was all sorts of fun things. They made delicious salads at the meal distributions. I know that we took the carrots and we roasted them and we served them with corn and potatoes. I mean, there were so many different fun things that we got to make and just really be creative with everything that we had growing in the gardens. Wow. That's just amazing as well. But out of all those producers that you just mentioned, which one of those describes you, Katie? Ooh, that was a tough one. Um, I don't know. I personally love snow peas. Snow peas are my favorites. They, I mean, we get hundreds and hundreds of them. And I'm going to put a twist on it. I think snow peas, because they kind of, they persevere through, like, we had the really hot snaps. And even though everything else was kind of starting to die off, the snow peas were still producing. They were still doing awesome. And so I'm going to go with snow peas and say, just because they didn't let the warm weather or anything get to them, they kept producing, and we got hundreds and hundreds of them. Oh, that's so amazing. That, that's really, really amazing to hear. Well, D. Katie Stoganalo, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to the award-winning Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you so much for having me. I had a wonderful time. Likewise. Thank you again.